Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take two data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor, with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So this is going to be an episode of the podcast where uh, both segments are kind of on some pretty heavy hitting material. We don't have the kind of palate cleanser necessarily that we sometimes offer, but it struck us that both of these subjects are time sensitive. And so we wanted to package them both into this week's episode. The second segment will be on Sri Lanka's debt crisis, uh, which is coming to a head right now. So stick around for that and the broader implications of that for the rest of the world. But first, the data point is $5,200. That is the extra amount of money the average U.S. household is expected to pay this year for the same set of goods it purchased the year before. Inflation is taking a big bite out of Americans' everyday budgets and savings. The average price of a Big Mac right now is a whopping $5.94. You look at your electrical bill, you look at your gas bill, you look now, especially now, food bill. It's ridiculous. So yes, the subject here is inflation. We've covered it before on the podcast, something that Adam has written about in his newsletter. But you know, we thought it's time to return to the topic. So Adam, you know, central banks in the West, you know, they seem pretty committed right now to continuing to raise interest rates this year. I guess the first question I have is, is will those interest rates make a difference for inflation? I mean, and I guess relatedly, what are the risks of raising interest rates for our national economies, for the global economy as a whole? What, what do you think? So the, the general idea is simple enough, I think. So you, you raise interest rates, you make credit more expensive, mortgages, credit cards, you know, auto loans, the whole works. That makes expenditure more expensive, so people will do less of it. It also makes saving more attractive because you could actually earn some money by putting some money aside in a savings account. So the overall effect is to reduce demand. And by reducing demand, you reduce pressure in markets and therefore hope to lower inflation. And there are historical examples of, of this working just like that. The most dramatic example in, in recent experience is the so-called Volcker shock of 1979, the decision by the then head of the Federal Reserve, America's central bank, Paul Volcker, to raise rates ultimately to 20%. And unsurprisingly, that crash landed the American economy and in inflation did eventually come down from a peak of 14.8%, so close to 15% in March 1980 to below 3% by 1983. And from then on in, really, inflation has been quite subdued. And since the 1980s, this relationship between interest rates and inflation is um, far less obvious than you might expect. Amongst economists, this is known as the so-called price puzzle. And the puzzle is that interest rate increases don't seem to go hand in hand with falling inflation. They, in fact, tend to, generally speaking, in many cases at least, go hand in hand with rising inflation. So how could that be? One idea is that it's an artifact. You raise rates when inflation is going up. That's what the central bank does. It doesn't raise them enough to actually strangle the inflation. And so what you get is the coincidence of rising interest rates and rising inflation. Or it could be an effect which is really perverse, whereby raising interest rates, you restrict supply in some way, not just demand. So this could be to do with companies not being willing to stock or cutting back on investment. Or it could be that raising rates sends a signal to consumers, if you like. They see interest rates going up, they panic and go out and spend before they go up even further, which causes inflation to spike. Now, altogether, anyway, it's a real puzzle. Uh, and another factor is that inflation is driven by commodity markets globally, and those aren't very sensitive to national interest rate um, policy. And so it's not actually obvious um, when you look, dig into this that Raising rates, though, on the face of it, it seems like the commonsensical things to do will actually have the effect that's intended. And there are quite likely some costs in the sense, and these are the risks, that you put pressure on people who've borrowed too much. You risk really a severe squeeze on balance sheets. That's why the push now by the central banks to raise rates is as controversial as it is, because this is a fine balance. And the very least one can say is that interest rates were a blunt instrument for dealing with inflation. So as far as I can tell, we haven't really seen significant wage increases that are 
keeping up with uh, the rate of inflation. Is that something we should hope to see at this point? Or instead, if this is transitory inflation and it's all going to work itself out in, in the near term, would increased wages just kind of introduce a new complicating factor? It's true. We haven't seen uh, wage increases commensurate with the price increases. So the result is that the so-called real wage has fallen. Um, real hourly earnings in the United States fell by perhaps 1.7% January to January 2021 to 2022. And in Europe, too, we're seeing pressure on real wages, downward pressure, that is. And that, that essentially means that people's purchasing power is falling, that households are slightly worse off than they were before. Now, if the price increases are eventually going to reverse and prices are actually going to decrease in future, in other words, we're actually going to get negative inflation in future, then you could be quite relaxed about the situation because there will be offsetting positive real wage gains. There will be offsetting positive gains in future. Um, that might be the case, for instance, with petrol, where you see prices go up and then go down again. But if the only prospect is that inflation, in other words, the rate of increase in prices, not the underlying prices themselves, calms down, then those losses in real income will never be made good. People will simply be worse off than they were before. And that's obviously an extremely serious matter because that erodes the standard of living. This isn't a temporary thing, in other words. That would be a permanent shift to their disadvantage. The only silver lining here is that if real wages are falling, you'd expect demand for labor to remain robust. In other words, we would have a reduced risk of unemployment and a lower risk, therefore, of you know what the real nightmare, which is stagflation, so a combination of inflation and unemployment. So you were just talking a minute ago, Adam, about the risks that are posed by increased interest rates and at the same time how those interest rates may not even make a difference in tamping down inflation. So I don't know, this raises for me the question of why is there this reliance on using interest rates to respond to inflation in the first place? I mean, are there other tools uh, that are available that, that we could be trying instead? It's an effect, you might say, of the triumph of, of monetarism, the, you know, the doctrine of economics associated with people like Milton Friedman that closely links price level to the quantity of money in circulation. And Friedman had this famous line where he said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And who does money? Central banks do money. And what's their main policy tool for controlling money with? It's the interest rate. So that's, as it were, the chain of association. And if you define inflation as the movement not of individual prices, but of all prices, this is almost by definition true, right? Because what can you define the price of all goods against relative to other than money? But even if monetary policy is the tool here for doing the control of inflation with, you, you have to ask why interest rates are the only monetary policy tool. So the Chinese right now, for instance, People's Bank of China uses a variety of more direct instruments for controlling the amount of credit that banks produce, which regulates the amount of purchasing power, actual money in circulation. And in the mid middle of the 20th century, Western central banks were much more pluralistic, if you like, in the range of tools that they would use. During World War II, for instance, the Fed in the United States imposed direct controls on consumer credit. Um, so introducing higher minimum down payments and maximum maturities on con consumer credit to uh, limit the amount of borrowing that households could do to buy what were during the war very scarce consumer goods. And they also adjusted the so-called reserve ratios of banks, which limits the amount of credit that banks can generate. So central banks could do all of these things. And there's been a retreat really in the era of you know what we call neoliberalism from the 1970s from all of those kind of intrusions, because they're highly regulative. They intrude into the business model of banks and financial institutions to this arm's length kind of instrument, which is interest rates. And so unsurprisingly, therefore, the idea of, you know, if, if getting inside the balance sheets of banks is controversial, the step of going, you know, one further and simply decreeing price stops of various types is even more controversial in the, in the current era. But as recently as the 1970s, this was the tool that was used. And, it, you know, if you're trying to control price increases, there's a sense of kind of an obviousness to saying, right, we should just stop them increasing. And that's what Nixon did in 1971, right? They froze 
oil prices in the United States. They didn't last. Once you do this, you introduce a series of distortions. Are you going to control absolutely every price? Are some prices going to be adjusted? And once you introduce a price control, can you step back from it? Can you ever actually extricate yourself from that? And it took until 1981 under Reagan for gasoline price control to finally be lifted in the United States. And for that intervening 10 years, essentially, consumers of gasoline in the United States were protected against the global shift in in oil prices, with the effect that people wanted more petrol, wanted more gasoline, and that contributed in part to the long lines, which infamously, you know, dogged the, the America's economy, the huge queues at, at gas stations across the country, both in 1973 and 1979, and not simply the result of the Arab oil boycotts, but also of a dysfunctional market. So there are real risks to using other techniques too. Hmm. Um, I mean, at this point, is it already clear who is most negatively affected by this inflation? And I guess on the flip side, is is there anyone who benefits from this inflation? Well, we've we've already identified the key, you know, losers in the short run, who are, which are basically workers whose wages have not adjusted in line with inflation, and they're suffering very substantial losses. In general, people will lose who have what are called monetary assets, nominal assets, and financial assets which don't adjust to inflation. Um, so savings accounts, cash, all of that, all of that is penalised because it loses value. Whereas if you're invested in real estate or equities. Generally speaking, one would expect those to be better hedged against the risks of inflation. They're not bomb-proof because, as we've seen, I mean, the equity markets in the US have been soft, to say the least, since the beginning of the year, as inflation has surged. It hasn't actually effectively acted as a hedge. But in general, you'd say that the people who are most vulnerable are people who have savings. On the other hand, debtors benefit. Anyone who's got a large long-term fixed interest mortgage loan in the United States is rubbing their hands right now because every single day that inflation goes on, the real value of that loan is eaten up, assuming that that person's wage ultimately will adjust and assuming that the property values which underpin the mortgage will ultimately adjust too. But if you put all that together, there's one really unambiguous winner out of all of this. I mean, who is it that issues the largest quantity of inflation unprotected debt. And that's the government. Everywhere in the world, governments are the biggest issuers of assets of that type. Uh, in, in the US right now, there's about $22 trillion of US treasuries and bills outstanding. And all of those are being attrited by inflation, which now is running at maybe 5% per annum. So we're talking about a huge transfer of wealth from the holders of those debts to the US government and, and a transfer which could be in the order of, you know, a trillion dollars or more in in value, um, comparable to that extent to the revenues from a major tax, not quite as much as income tax, but, you know, heading up in that direction. Who ultimately is the beneficiary of that transfer? Well, you know, who is the government? Ultimately, what we're talking about here are taxpayers. So the more tax you pay, the more you benefit from the um, reduction in the real value of the debt, which ultimately has to be serviced out of taxes. And that redounds to the benefit, obviously, of higher income groups, because in the United States in particular, it's higher income groups which pay the vast majority of tax. Huh. Well, I mean, unless the government's realized that we can afford to spend more under these circumstances. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't you know. know. But in the but as a, in the first instance, it's the taxpayer and the government account that, that uh, achieves this benefit. Yeah, yeah. So finally, I, I thought I'd ask you to put your historian's hat on here. I, I mean, I, I was wondering if there's anything distinct about this bout of inflation. I mean, uh, clearly, it's not the first time our societies have experienced inflation. I mean, you mentioned the 70s as the most recent precedent. But I, I wonder if the experience of it this time has been any different. I mean, maybe precisely in light of all the historical baggage we're, we're, we're bringing to it? Or, you know, maybe another way of saying this is, are, are all bouts of inflation the same? Or, you know, are they all difficult in, in, in different ways? Yeah, it's a really fascinating question. And I mean, one of the things you notice is that inflation numbers, they're kind of like a memory trace, right? When 
when the number hits you know a certain level all of a sudden you start saying well this is the most rapid inflation in 40 years and then you go back through the historical data and you found that moment and then people project themselves back into that time and certainly as inflation has risen in Europe and the United States there's been a whole wave of kind of commemoration historical investigation of what happened in the 1970s i think if you if you do the comparison, what you discover is there's far more difference than there is fun similarity fundamentally between the two moments. Um, the huge difference is that in the 1970s, there was very substantial pressure from organized labor, from trade unions that could actually drive wages. They didn't always succeed. Real wages went down for much of the 70s as well. But then there was a pushback. And so there was more of a seesaw, if you like, between bargaining parties in the labor market. We're not seeing much of that this time round. And what we are seeing is this incredibly idiosyncratic supply shock, these shocks to global supply chains, which are quite novel. And so to that extent, I think the memory of the 70s is is, is really rather misleading with regard to the, the issues that we face in the current moment. Got it. Yeah. Maybe there were fewer reasons to be anxious about inflation if you knew you had a strong union uh, on your side. Well, well, precisely. This makes decision making from the point of view of policymakers easier because they don't have to deal with that social struggle mm. but on the other hand absolutely yeah one of the one of the things that's happened is that this balance of power has shifted radically against against labor and um that does indeed expose people who don't have any bargaining power in the labor market to really rather serious risks faced with these kind of price increases the question of course is whether they might not respond right so so there is, after all, in the United States right now, a quite marked revival of organized labor of trade unions. And, and part of that, I think, is the sense that unless you do, you will be at the mercy of, of markets and prices that are rising in a very uh, threatening way. Hmm. Yeah, it's also interesting to think that this is the bout of inflation that we'll be telling future generations about. But I guess that's just how history always works. Anyway, we have to leave it here, um, but we will be right back to talk about Sri Lanka. Hi, and welcome back. We're going to be talking about Sri Lanka, and the data point here is $51 billion. That is the size of the foreign debt that the Sri Lankan government defaulted on last week. In fact, this is the worst ever economic crisis that we are looking at in Sri Lanka in memory that we've seen. The entire $51 billion external debt has been suspended. The country is now experiencing its worst economic crisis since it gained independence. Its foreign reserves have dwindled, which means it can't pay for imports. There are are acute shortages of food and fuel and medical supplies. The government is, you know, weighing its options, trying to find a, a bailout somewhere, anywhere. It can, it can, it can find it. Um, meanwhile, protesters are on the streets, and you know they're being met with some violent force from police. There, police used tear gas to break up the crowd. At which point, the crowd responded by throwing stones. In order to control the situation, the police opened fire. We don't know how this is all going to work out, but I think one thing that we realize is that this could be a preview of other debt crises to come. And in any case, it, you know, it's a feature of the global economy at this moment that deserves some attention. So, Adam, I mean, maybe just to start, I'm guessing most people don't know the underlying structure of the Sri Lankan economy. I mean, has it been precarious for a really long time? How did, how did it get to this point? Yeah, it really has. I mean, post-independence from Britain... Um, in 1948, Sri Lanka's economy was overwhelmingly dominated by commodity exports. So tea, which is, of course, very famous for Ceylon tea, is is uh, Ceylon is the old name for Sri Lanka. So whenever you order that in your cafe, that's that's what you're drinking. Uh, so tea, coffee, rubber, spices were its staples. And that's a recipe for vulnerability, because in good years, you do fine. Uh, and in bad years, you suffer a balance of payments shock. And that means that you run out of foreign exchange and you, you can't buy the imports which you rely on because your economy is not diversified. So Sri Lanka doesn't make, for instance, the fertilizer it needs for its own agricultural sector, even though agriculture is critical to its economy. Um, so since 1965, Sri Lanka has had 16 separate IMF loans. 
Um, it's been a series, essentially, of run-ins with the international financial institutions, each one of which comes with conditionality, which constrains the sovereignty of the Sri Lankan government, which sometimes then leaves it in, unable to react to downturns in the domestic economy. So you have a stop, start, stop, go kind of pattern. And the last loan uh, was issued by the IMF to Sri Lanka in 2016 for $1.5 billion. Sri Lanka is a, a small economy, a population of 22 million um, relatively low income. So these aren't giant loans, but they put Sri Lanka under very serious pressure already. And then in 2019, um, there was a horrific uh, bombing by Islamic radicals of churches and luxury hotels in Colombo, which inflicted a huge hit to the tourist economy. Um, Sri Lanka became perceived of as a, as a dangerous location. Um, and so, yes, the, the, one would have to say the Sri Lankan economy was always close to the edge. Okay, so that's good background. I mean, but but when it comes to this sort of acute crisis, uh, I mean, w w what does this have to do with Western policy? Was this triggered by the raising of interest rates that, that we talked about in the first segment by, by the Fed and other central banks in the West? I mean, and in some sense, kind of, does this all trace back to the pandemic in a way? I mean, I, how, how does this all link together? Well, starting in 2019, Sri Lanka was really tumbling towards extreme difficulty and then the pandemic really polaxes the economy because that knocks the tourist economy out. Then there's a new government, uh, President Gotabaya Rajapaska comes in and they adopt some, one has to say, truly erratic uh, economic policy. Running out of foreign exchange, they decide, you know what you're going to do? They're going to ban all fertilizer import with uh, the view to turning the entire Sri Lankan economy into an organic economy overnight. So it's going to specialize in organic our farming catastrophic impact of that, of course, on uh, agricultural productivity in the short in the short run had to be reversed in November 2021. This is a, a government that's basically been struggling from the start with COVID as the immediate uh, driver of its crisis. And the prospective interest rate increases, which so far really have not had a direct impact on Sri Lanka, are, as it were, sort of the, the nightmare coming further down the road. Um, these problems are largely generated by Sri Lanka's domestic issues and the shock of COVID. So, I mean, who's going to step up and help right now? I mean, how does this work in, in practice? Is the IMF up to the job right now? Uh, I mean, and meanwhile, what are what are Sri Lanka's neighbors, you know, China and India, what are they doing to step up? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the really critical issue. I mean, apart from the drama in Sri Lanka itself and the, the millions of people it affects is... Sri Lanka is, a sense, a test run for what the global financial institutions might be able to do right now. And there's a lot of talk in the context of the Ukraine crisis and the sanctions on Russia and what the future of the dollar system is going to look like and whether they're going to be you know, Chinese and Russian alternatives. But if we're actually concerned with how the existing system functions in the short run, in the medium term, over the next couple of years, then it's really in places like Sri Lanka that we have to look to see what resources can be mobilized and how generous they could be. And that's why I think it, it really has a, as an urgency and a, a significance beyond the, the crisis that, that, that millions of people are suffering there. Um, and it's very interesting to see what is happening because India has emerged as a key actor here. So India itself has provided billions of dollars in support to Sri Lanka. I mean, once upon a time, you would have thought that this balance being maybe perhaps the other way around, uh, Sri Lanka was slightly wealthier than India. But with India's growth of late and emergence as a major global power, certainly a regional power, India is now uh, backing um, Sri Lanka with, with loans, with lines of credit so it, to enable Sri Lanka to import vital things like fuel, for instance. There have been huge lines of Sri Lankans desperately queuing up. And then even things like a swap line, which was basically an agreement between the Indian Central Bank and the Sri Lankan Central Bank to give them access to to foreign currency and India at the meetings of the IMF and the World Bank that have taken place uh, in these days in, in Washington, D.C., has been pushing the IMF to, to offer support as well. I mean, rather cheekily, the Sri Lankans have, have applied for a rapid financing instrument. Now, a rapid financing instrument, as people have immediately pointed out, is not intended for countries in their situation. A rapid financing instrument is a tool, light touch tool the IMF devised 
for countries that were suddenly hit, blindsided, if you like, by shocks to commodity prices or COVID type shocks. So they come with minimal conditionality, which is no doubt why the Sri Lankans quite like the look of one of those programs. But the fact of the matter is they have $35 billion worth of debt, which they can't service. They probably owe seven in debt service back this year. Their foreign exchange reserves are massively depleted. So they need something far more structural, which is why the big actors, India, uh, is getting involved. And the other factor here is that one of the major creditors to Sri Lanka is China. Uh, In fact, the entire narrative that listeners may have heard of, of Chinese debt imperialism and its strong arming of countries which have borrowed money from China originates in Sri Lanka. And it was not coincidentally Indian think tank experts which set this story running because they were horrified by the prospect of China muscling into their near neighbor in the Indian Ocean. Uh, In fact, China is, is not Sri Lanka's largest lender. Japan has that dubious privilege. And the Chinese have actually, you know, opened negotiations with the Sri Lankan about renegotiating the terms of the debt that Sri Lanka owes them, which which runs into the billions. And um, right now, you know, they're also providing relief. So Sri Lanka is fascinating because it shows the arm wrestling that's going on, the geopolitical struggle that's going on right now between not just the United States and the rest of the world, but India and China by way of institutions like the IMF. So, I mean... You know, in light of all this, what are the potential sort of cascade effects here for the global economy? I mean, you refer to this almost as a kind of test case. I mean, so are there other potential defaults on the horizon that we should be looking out for or expecting? I mean, is this maybe even the kind of seed of a broader global financial crisis? Well, Sri Lanka probably poses no immediate threat to anyone but itself, basically, um, because it's too small. Um, China and India are involving themselves not because of the risk of financial fallout, but because of geopolitical concerns. But Sri Lanka is, I think, widely seen as a harbinger of other risks around the world. The World Bank, the IMF, the UN Development Programme, UNCTAD have all warned of an impending wave of debt crises around the world as fragile economies with large debts face the triple hit of rising interest rates, rising food prices and rising oil prices. And that just makes for a very dangerous combination. Now, no one, I think, thinks this is going to be like the Latin American debt crisis of the 1980s, which threatened the integrity of the American banking system at times. It's not uniform either. So who does well and who does badly out of this situation is is really quite, it's a kind of lottery, right? So near neighbors like Algeria and Tunisia have absolutely contrasting fortunes right now with Algeria doing well out of high oil and gas prices and Tunisia being really hard hit. Um, But what we're looking at across the world are, you know, perhaps as many as 50, 60, 70 countries which are facing debt service payments which have risen by 45% over two years. Uh, You had a great piece by Mark Mallock Brown um, in Foreign Policy um, a couple of weeks ago that was outlining this. And he was saying that about half of all low-income countries right now around the world are either officially in debt distress or at high risk of it. So there is piled up there the risk of of an avalanche um, of which Sri Lanka might not be the trigger, but it might be, as it were, the first of these poorer and weaker countries to go. So I guess finally, I mean, what does this whole story about Sri Lanka tell us about the, the, the growth models available to developing countries these days? I mean, is this an instance where, you know speculators uh, are responsible partly for, for this disaster? I mean, should countries, you know, like Sri Lanka be resisting the kinds of investment that have been available? Or is this kind of just all local economic mismanagement? I mean, what is the kind of broader context for this? Well, private credit has taken on an increasingly significant role in low-income and developing countries over the recent decades and under normal circumstances, without you know wanting to wave the flag for market solutions and whatever, it, it should be regarded, I think, as a sign of progress, right? It means that global investors who have options are interested in taking risks and see a potential positive future in what they call frontier markets. So I don't think it will be fair, as it were, to blame speculators in this instance for this crisis. But once the model begins to unravel once a creditor that has borrowed too much hits difficulties for whatever reason. The fact that they are beholden to complex webs of a combination of private, public, bilateral, multilateral lending, 
makes things really difficult to resolve. So, you know, Sri Lanka owes money to the IMF, it owes money to China, it owes money to India, it may well owe money to banks, there will be bondholders that uh, are bought into its debt. And all of those creditors need to be brought together through some resolution mechanism, because that's where we need to head, and as soon as possible, really, because Sri Lanka isn't ever going to be able to service this debt, and the longer it tries, the more depleted its resources become. And that's really where the global architecture of debt really falls down right now. We do not have a good mechanism for coordinating and, to a degree, and in the end, compelling creditors around the world to offer debtors reasonable terms. Because when you lend to countries like Sri Lanka, you are taking the very you know, serious risk that you will end up in default. And there needs to be a process for that default when it happens. During the 2020 COVID crisis, the debt service suspension initiative that was put in place by the G20 was a, was a laughing stock, really. It was derisory and the, the support that it offered. It didn't really offer any net relief. It simply staggered it stretched out the payments that you had to make. Then by the end of that year, the G20 had come up with something that's called the Common Framework, which is a set of principles under which debtors and creditors are supposed to come to terms. But so far, only three countries have even attempted to use that mechanism and to very little effect on their part. So we don't right now, and this is one of the things that's so worrying about this threat of a more comprehensive debt crisis, we really currently do not have good mechanisms for resolving complex, multi-creditor, public-private, multilateral, bilateral type debt crises. And that is our reality now. And to point the finger just at, you know, private creditors on the one hand or China on the other simplifies what is a truly complex and messy situation that we're in. Got it. Uh, Yeah, it sounds... From uh, the way you were describing it, there's going to be plenty of opportunity to practice um, uh, figuring out these, uh, unwinding these complicated uh, debts. You know, Sri Lanka is probably not the last uh, in in the coming post-pandemic period to deal with this. But um, we will leave it there for this week. That was another episode of Ones and Twos. My thanks, as always, to uh, my co-host, Adam Twos. And listeners, as always, we like hearing your feedback. Please email us at podcast at foreignpolicy.com or you can also tweet us at ones and twos pod. Remember, that's twos as in Adam's name. That's T O O Z E. Ones and twos is written by me, Cameron Abadi, and Adam Twos. It's produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. And the executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you back in your feed next week. Bye.